Like, so I'm actually half American, so in, in English it's oh, Rick and Jaffe. Rick and Jaffe. Jaffe. Ah, uh, Jaffe. Oh, oh my God, I thought. Uh, but in, in Dutch it's Jaffe. Yeah, Jaffe. Okay. Jaffe. Okay. Perfect. And then uh, I think most of the people here will be familiar with your work, but I, let me introduce you as well. And uh, Rifke Jaffe will be uh, is a professor at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And then she explores the intersections of urban and the politics, especially through uh, specialization and materialization of power, difference and inequality in cities. And she has, of course, uh, conducted extensive field research in Jamaica and then has numerous publications, I'm sure you all know, and including her monograph, I will say, maybe mentioned here, uh, it's Concrete Jungles, and it came out from uh, Oxford University Press in 2016. And then today, Rifke, uh, Jaffe will be talking about community and justice in urban Jamaica and how vigilantism uh, can be understood as a legal or like a form of legal hybridity or as an entanglement of uh, multiple legal uh, systems. The floor is yours. Just juggling around with um, share screen. Oh. Um, okay, here goes. I'll try to type myself. Thank you. Um, so in, in my paper today, I want to focus on the role of informal leaders in Jamaica known as DODs and how they provide what's known as community justice. Um, and I'm particularly interested in exploring the DODs neighborhood level justice practices. So what we could easily gloss as vigilantism and to, to explore that in relation to the concept of the law. Uh, now, vigilantism is generally associated with extra legal or outlaw practices that are aimed at still maintaining a specific normative order. Uh, but I want to look a little closer at what does it mean to, to take the law into your own hands, as it's described also in the call for this, this conference. Uh, what does it mean to take the law in your hands to, to punish transgressions? And um, rather than focusing primarily on the use of violence, I, I want to look more at, at normativity and normative systems as, as law uh, and to draw on concepts from legal anthropology to uh, conceptualize these, these um, what you could call vigilante practices. Of course, law and violence are related in, in many ways, uh, but, but the general emphasis uh, in, in studies of vigilantism uh, has, has been on violence. Um, so specifically, I want to suggest that vigilantism, or at least the form I encountered in Jamaica, that shouldn't necessarily be understood as extra legal or even as a form of legal pluralism, which I initially was interested in thinking uh, myself. So how, how you might see this as a parallel normative system to that of the state. But I want to think about how uh, it's actually maybe a form of legal hybridity where you see multiple normative, institutionalized normative systems entangled and um, uh, consistently so. Let me start with a brief introduction of the phenomenon I'm discussing. So uh, in earlier decades, basically up to the turn of the century, were actually uh, regular mob killings in Jamaica. Um, and that was generally seen as an expression of disillusionment with the workings of the, of the uh, general sort of state justice system. But it, it, over the past 20 years, this type of what you could call spontaneous vigilantism has almost entirely disappeared. And it seems to have been displaced by uh, what you've seen as a more organized form of vigilantism known as community justice or, or more disparagingly, and I'd say racist term is a jungle justice. But I'm calling it community justice. Um, just to briefly focus on this opening picture here, here is the mobilization uh, against the extradition of one of the country's uh, most powerful nuns, uh, who was known as Duddis. A bit of a fuzzy picture, but you see um, a woman holding up a sign saying Duddis is a better security officer, better than the police. Give him his props, give him his proper respect. So it's taking the boss is like taking Jesus. So, uh, but uh, you, you see this also just in uh, everyday life in the streets. So one uh, neighborhood I'm uh, working in for a little bit, I was walking and I saw this uh, graffiti, no stealing in our community. So I was like, okay, here's a norm that we're trying to express. And as I walked a little further, I saw also all thieves will be killed, all thieves will be killed. So this is also the system then, uh, of enforcing those norms. Um, a community justice is concentrated specifically in low income near, uh, urban neighborhoods where I've called inner city neighborhoods and it's connected to uh, the rule of informal leaders known as dons. And um, perhaps ironically, these dons themselves are often involved in criminal activities from extortion to drug trafficking. 
Um, and, and politicians and wealthier Jamaicans commonly call them gang leaders, not necessarily uh, area leaders or neighborhood leaders. Uh, but for many residents of these neighborhoods, domiship can actually represent a more ethical type of rule than uh, that of the state. Uh, this is specifically, I'd say, in light of their experience um, with a legal system that these residents perceive as ineffective, as corrupt, as biased against low-income Black Jamaicans. Um, and, and in this context, the violently enforced community justice system that, that Don's uh, organized appears more legitimate than, than the formal justice system. Um, but it should be said that the Don's who enjoy the most legitimacy are those who are known to punish transgressions within their territory uh, swiftly and, and also violently. Um, so Don's function as important local policing agents. Uh, they organize effective systems of surveillance, uh, but also importantly, they really set as well as enforce norms within the neighborhood territory. Um, and this is often contrasted to the, the state police, the Jamaica Constabulary Force, uh, and here we see both poor and rich Jamaicans tend to consider the, the Jamaica Constabulary Force, the ACF, to be at best unreliable and at worst actively organized uh, actively engaged in, in large-scale organized crime themselves. Uh, the police has consistently been associated with systemic corruption, but also very high rates of extrajudicial killings. Um, and I think the, the institutionalization of illegal and violent practices on the part of the police, uh, it, it amounts to a clear form of state crime, uh, or perhaps because also state vigilantism to the extent that these extrajudicial killings are often uh, broadly supported by, by different, like across the population. Um, so that already complicates straightforward understandings of, of what is extra legal, what is the outlaw. Uh, but let me briefly give some examples of, of community justice, how it works, uh, to explain also why I think we might understand it as an instance of legal hybridity. So we start with some uh, brief quotes from an interview uh, with uh, a retired Don, I call him second. Uh, he was connected to the West Kings neighborhood where I did most of my research. And he explained to me uh, his informal policing role that had two dimensions, external and internal. External was um, sort of defending your area against violators from neighboring communities, but internal uh, meant splitting justice in an impartial manner. So uh, in addition to that defending your area, splitting justice, uh, you have to do it because everyone comes to you. And it's basically also about uh, sorting out conflicts within the neighborhood. And what he emphasizes that really you can't take sides, even if it's your friends, you have to really um, take it up because he said, if the people find you're not giving justice, if you're taking it up with your friends, it will be unbalanced. Uh, so this is a serious position uh, as a Don. He also explained how Dons would intervene, not just in this type of uh, say, conflict between um, uh, neighbors, but also within households. So for instance, if a male resident was beating his female partner, the Don would listen to both parties and then uh, he would intervene with either a verbal or physical warning to the aggressor. So he calls it the man. Uh, so the man here is both the Don and, and the man they're talking to. But he said, once they go to the Don, if the Don says, I want it to be finished, it has to be finished. And if you're else the, the abusive partner, they'll come to you and they'll say, don't, don't touch your partner. And basically, also, their rules are stricter than the police, whether you like it or not. Um, so this type of law, whether it's in, in sort of public space or, or domestic space, uh, is, is largely evident in the context of conflict resolution, as, as this description uh, suggests. Um, so residents can report local normative transgressions from theft and domestic abuse, also rape, to the neighborhood Don, and the Don will then seek to identify the guilty party and decide an appropriate punishment. And in some cases, there's sort of informal uh, almost a jury, so community elders will be involved. And the punishments may range from a verbal warning to banishment from the neighborhood, which is quite, quite impactful, uh, to various forms of physical violence, including in extreme cases, death. Yeah. Now, this form of policing is it's personless, it's very focused on the Don, it's violently retributive, uh, but still many residents understand it to be more efficient, but also more fair uh, than, than that that's offered by the state and the court system. And also it's, it's rooted in broadly shared norms. In the neighborhood uh, where I did most of my field work, I call Bricktown, various residents described the, the important role that their Don, we call the general, he's now in prison, uh, his important role in keeping their neighborhood safe, but also just orderly. Um, 
the importance of being again not just efficient but also fair came out clearly in the conversation I had with uh, Mikey, uh, a business owner in his 30s, and he, he was a big fan of the general. But he said he's really an advocate for equal rights and justice. He splits justice down the middle. So really, it doesn't matter where you're from, who you are, rich or poor. He's straightforward, and again, he would not you know, take. Uh, his family or his friend's side over your side. So again, this imports on equality, I think should be read in contrast to uh, a general legal system, a court system that's seen as very um, biased uh, towards richer, light-skinned, uh, educated Jamaicans. Um, but uh, in addition to, to this type of uh, conflict uh, resolution, they, they also delineate and enforce other types of norms and laws. So I, I taught a homework club at a, a community center with children from two different adjacent neighborhoods, and they spontaneously began to list and also compare uh, the rules of their, their two respective dons. In the first neighborhood, the don would not allow smoking under the age of 15, but in the second neighborhood, uh, you weren't allowed to smoke in front of adults. If you did outside of it, it was okay. Um, other rules included curfews for children, so those under the age of 12 had to be off the street by 8 p.m., whereas those under 15 could stay out to 10 p.m., and so on. But both these children seem, seem to support these rules quite, quite directly, and also their parents uh, tend to, to uh, appreciate this type of, sort of centralized enforcement of norms or rules, and to see it really as an important positive contribution that Don could make to his community and, and also to sort of youth development. Um, so many people in uptown Kingston, sort of the wealthier Jamaican areas, might consider the residents of these Donland neighborhoods as lawless or uh, outlaws. But I think the, the normativity that Dons are associated with is institutionalized to such an extent that really we can understand it as a legal system, as sort of an institutionalized relatively quite stable uh, normative system, one that sets out, it sets out collective norms and sanctions their transgressions and what those norms are uh, uh, not followed. So it's tempting to read, and I, I read it myself this way initially, to, to look at this type of institutionalized normative system as a type of legal pluralism, so a phenomenon that's defined both simply as um, it's a definition from, from the 80s, the presence in a social field of more than one legal order, so it's a coexistence. Uh, but I think this, this criminally enforced legal system that I've, I've very briefly described, it doesn't function as a parallel system. It's, it's not separate from Jamaica's formal legal system, nor is it necessarily at odds or antagonistic to um, state law. Now, some of the acts that Don's identify as transgression do clash directly with state law. So for instance, one of the rules is uh, informer for dead. If you inform, if you talk to the police, then, then death is the sanction. So obviously that clashes uh, with, with the police. Um, but many other norms um, regarding the use of violence, uh, but also uh, the behavior of children, they overlap largely with either Jamaica's formal legal system or with more general societal norms. Meanwhile, also uh, this, this personalist, again, sort of centered on one, one man uh, justice system, is also often actively enabled by members of the police force. Uh, so I've heard many instances where people say like, if you take this or this to the police and you say it happened there or there, they'll say like, oh, if it happened there or it's this type of transgression, don't come to the police station, take it to the Don. So they'll actively sort of redirect and outsource to the Don system. Um, but also community justice relies on institutionalized norms that, that often coincide with the laws of the Jamaican state. Um, to the extent I, I think that state policing has, has appropriated or absorbed, uh, ab adopted some of the strategies utilized by Dons. So for me, rather than seeing the Don-based normative or if you will, legal system uh, as indicating the existence of, of legal pluralism as fully or only that's largely distinct and separate from the state law, I think we might understand it really as part of legal hybridity. Let me try to explain why. Um, so as I just noted briefly, the, the police force tasked with upholding the law frequently operates itself outside of the legal regulatory framework that it's embedded in. Um, and and uh, that's partially because you say, okay, some of those people are criminal, but it's also because broader social norms guide the everyday practices of the state police force. And those norms are also shaped by the Don's practices. Um, so many Jamaicans, including also some residents uh, of low income areas, they may support the use of violence, retributive violence, both by Dons and the police, 
as long as this violence is directed as what they call criminals, um, which of course is a flexible category. So the Don's legitimacy is, is partially rooted in the willingness to wield violence in a way that neighborhood residents consider proper. Um, and, and this type of sympathetic assessment of the Don's use of violence, it suggests um, that, that the social norms not only emphasize fairness, so the splitting justice down the middle, but you could say it's sort of democratic policing perhaps, but there's also really a widespread support for more punitive, more author authoritarian forms of, of order making. So it's sort of a mix of, of a desire for equality and fairness of the dons represent and a desire for retributive authoritarian policing that go together. And I think the Jamaican family force, the formal police really recognize this. They're really sensitive to this type of social norms that mix equality with authoritarianism. Um, so in fact, in recent years, I really see some of the police practices appear to actively, uh, sometimes formally mimic, mimic the dons modes of uh, policing. Okay, I have uh, about one minute so I'm going to wrap up, but just to give you some quick examples, uh, we, we see cases where the, um, the dons have um, initiated popular youth curfews, uh, but, but now we see also the police uh, developing this type of curfews in uh, inner city areas. So here's a flyer you see where they outline this initiative and the West Kingston uh, Police Division who was developing this, uh, they say explicitly that the idea of a curfew in the home or even the community, it's not new, but the uniqueness of the strategy is obvious in the involvement of the police. So they're, they're actively, they don't name Don's per se, but they say like, yes, this existed before, but now it's us. Other times you, you see them sort of, uh, using uh, their violence as, as a punitive uh, of strategy in um, really deliberate attempts to, to not just emulate, but also displace the Don-based model of authority that, that's based on retributive violence. But they also uh, have softer forms of, of folks trying to promote legitimacy. Very quickly, as the Dons are also involved in sort of using popular culture to legitimate uh, their practices. I've worked with Martin Osterman on this. So uh, one thing Dons do is organize uh, street dances. And now this is for instance, a poster uh, associated with Dutta's, this major Don. It's very similar sort of in the, uh, to the police citizen link up where they're also saying like, oh, now it's the police organizing dances for you at the police station. Very close to where Dutta's organized his dances. Um, but finally, and to me, this may be the most explicit example of, of where community justice becomes absorbed in the state system of justice. Uh, over the past decade, you had a new Ministry of Justice policy uh, that led to the opening of several, kind of a picture, but several restorative justice centers in inner city areas across the island. Um, so police, but also community members, they can refer a local dispute to this center rather than to the formal legal uh, institution such as a court system or, or taking it to the police station. So this is a distinct but clearly uh, analogous system to the community justice system uh, where both police and residents would refer inc incidents to the Don. So the policy here, it explicitly recognizes that Don's, I uh, quote, set the community, or set the tone for community values and are said to have a hand in all dispute resolutions of significance. And of course, so uh, they really see this as a, an attempt to to take over what the Dons developed and then make it a state policy, uh, a type of sort of low level, very, very accessible type of dispute uh, resolution. Um, so these centers are explicitly intended to counter the Dons punitive retributive form of dispute resolution, so to go beyond rep reprisal culture and be restorative. But at the same time, they've also clearly and explicitly absorbed features of the Dons community justice system. So I think here we can really see this as a sort of a, a mixing, a, a type of hybrid justice system. So just to end, I think the various state interventions that I've mentioned here, not just at the police, but also Ministry of Justice level, so neighborhood level dispute resolution, retributive policing, youth curfews, they're intended to replace uh, the rule of the dawn, but at the same time, they really reproduce some of their more popular measures. And I think this absorption of of the Don's methods of norm enforcement. It both reflects and reproduces the entanglement between Don's and the formal state. And, and it's, it's this fluid movement uh, of methods, but also of, of norms that circulate really uh, between institutions and across the country that suggests that we should approach Don's not as outlaws, not even as a form of legal pluralism, but as a form of legal hybridity. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Jaffe. Uh, this was interesting, especially I like, like the police link up post. Actually, <laughs> it's super colorful. Okay, we are moving on to. Uh, we will get back, I guess. I'm sure there will be questions, but after all the like uh, presentations. And then uh, our second presenter today is Ahmed Moradi, who is a postdoc here at Fry University, actually. And then he works on revolution, militancy, and care in Iran and wider Middle East and North African context. And then he conducted research on paramilitary organizations in Iran, uh, the Basij, and then they are tasked with uh, to maintain um, with maintaining security and then I don't know, safety in urban settings, I guess. And then his uh, monograph is soon to be published by the Edinburgh University Press. We are looking forward to this, I guess. And then he's going to talk about today on how Basij, I guess. Vigilantism operates at the intersections of religion, intimacy, and local socialities across neighborhoods. In, uh, in, in uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, and thanks for organizing such a rich and engaging workshop. Well, I didn't dare to design a uh, PowerPoint slide, like, and um, so I'm going to read from my paper. Um, so, what does it take to live a life as a violent vigilante, local state officer, and revolutionary militia in a poor neighborhood? Drawing on ethnographic research with paramilitary organization of the Basij in an Iranian seaside town, this paper explores forms of sociality and conflicting moral orders that the Basij's security interventions produce in a poor neighborhood in Iran. I argue that governing a neighborhood through uh, vigilante groups is closely linked to social uh, sociality, to local sociality, while security always entails some degrees of intimacy and the constant breach of those intimate bondings. Since the 1979 revolution, Almost all urban neighborhoods in Iran have hosted a paramilitary base of the Basij. They were one of the first undertakings of the revolutionaries immediately after taking control of cities in 1979 and were envisioned to be central in policing the urban social order. In the years of the Iran-Iraq war, 1980 to 1988, Basij bases played an active role in mobilizing and recruiting volunteers for the front and providing necessary manpower. manpower. In the post-war years, the Basij maintained in its presence in neighborhoods and its bases continued serving as places for extensive cultural, political, and military training. Given the wide range of their activities, the Basij bases in general serve as both structures of social control and places designed to recruit and train revolutionary forces. As a consequence of this situation, over the last four decades, the Basij bases have become places of intense social interaction and places where different forms of engagement with the revolution are articulated and practiced through governmental technologies. Governmental technologies, as Rose and Miller defined them, are the complex mundane programs, calculation, techniques, apparatuses, documents, and procedures which authorities utilize in order to shape the beliefs and conduct of others in desired directions by acting upon their will, their circumstances, or their environment. These technologies, they note, do not create an all-encompassing web of social control. Rather, they work through countless often competing local tactics of education, persuasion, inducement management, incitement, motivation, and encouragement. I found the Basij involvement in organizing local people's lives to be a significant arena for analyzing a multiplicity of governmental interventions and for shedding new light on the flexibility and variations that categorize the, that ca characterize governmental practices in present day Iran. I am interested in how members of the Basij subscribe to projects and ideas of revolution 
an attempt to translate them into practices within their neighborhoods, out of which they create a space for residents to engage in and experience the Basija's daily production of authority and governmental power. Although, as I suggest, the presence of Basij bases present, represents the tangible exertion of governmental power over neighborhoods, we would fall short of a complete picture should we neglect the ongoing compromises Basijis make by acknowledging neighborhood relationships. For this reason, I intend to show how techniques of government are interspersed with local techniques of sociality. In so doing, I follow Vina Dust's approach, which recognizes neighborhood as the right scale. The, the analytical purchase of which comes from the force of its, its empir empirical character and not from, from it as an abstraction. As she explains, one place to locate the technology of government is in, in, it is in the practices followed by bureaucrats. Such technologies, however, also have a life outside the offices of the bureaucrats as they are negotiated in, in other places, such as in the low income neighborhoods. Focusing on the neighborhood, therefore, allows me to focus on the micro scale at which institutions of different scales intersect and are enfolded into neighborhood relations and where conflicts and negotiations of local groups are made and unmade. One important aspect of these constant negotiations is in the formations or in the formation of communities of complicity. The social and political landscapes of neighborhoods reproduce a specific power relations and reveal the many ways in which the increasingly complex interests of individuals, families, and groups interact and clash with the goals of the state. The multiplicity of social and political relations not only fosters conflicts, it also shapes forms of loyal, loyalty and strategic, strategic alliances. To explain this, this situation, I draw on Hans Steinmuller, Steinmuller's work, which deals with the everyday life of official discourses in vernacular processes, processes within which Chinese villagers and local officials use irony to express the differences between the official version of what is to be a Chinese peasant or a good official on the one hand, and the pragmatic actualities that is life at its, as it's actually lived on the other. Steinmuller explains that this process is deeply informed by a shared sense of intimacy between villagers and local officials. Through this intimacy, these groups, these two groups constitute what he calls communities of complicity. I found the concept of communities of complicity useful to account for how neighborhood residents and local members of the Basij actively negotiated the tensions between Basij propagated discourses and local sociality, the kind of, the kind of tensions that bind these people that the bind these two groups together. In Steinmuller's account, local officials are not mere representatives of the state, but an essential part of the communities of complicity. He notes that the local officials and villagers share an intimate knowledge and familiarity with local practices, and that, and, and that the complicity and that the complicity they share is based on shared experiences in local sociality on the one hand and on, and on an intimate knowledge of the condemnation of some, some elements of it on the other. In his ethnography, Steinmuller shows that local officials experience embarrassment as they take part in officially condemned practices such as favors or gambling. Viewing embarrassment as an indispensable part of communities of complicity, Steinmuller makes use of Hart, um, Hartsfield's concept of cultural intimacy as a recognition of those aspects of a cultural identity that are considered a source of external embarrassment, but that nevertheless provide insiders with their assurance of common sociality. In this sense, what local practices 
have in common is the fact that their outside representation is overwhelmingly negative, whilst they are really essential in everyday life. As concluding remarks, to say neighborhoods present a rich train for ethnographic inquiry in, into the conflictual nature of collective life in cities. Taking up neighborhoods as a unit of analysis, ethnographic research is especially well suited to, ex to examine ordinary urban lives, revealing the abiding tensions in microgeographies and the way in which collective life is imbued with conflict. Reitman argues that the real collective level of lives as lived in neighborhoods is not a construction. It's a fact, as neighborhoods provide a shared space where residents breathe the same air, experience similar events, and struggle through similar contradictions. Indeed, it does not mean that the neighborhoods are a bounded entity or a homo homogeneous unit. There are multiple actors with different ideological persuasions and varying degrees of connection to the institutions of power who will participate in governing neighborhoods and shape the life lived collectively. In my project, I focused on the Basij as one of the key actors in Iranian urban settings. The sheer number of Basij bases in neighborhoods and the extension of their, their interventions have given, the, uh, have given the Basij a prominent role in regulating collective life at the neighborhood level. Such a role is substantially reinforced by the distinctive technologies of control that they employ. Nonetheless, we fall short of giving a complete picture should we stop at describing the besiege of neighborhoods only as, a mechan only as mechanisms of social control. While the besiege continues to exert, exert its power over the residents, the members of the besiege increasingly appear to locals as low level state functionaries who are there to serve as the visible face of the state and to redress uh, local grievances. The besiege of neighborhoods, therefore, is involved in, in administrative and hierarchical rela rela rationalities that provide seemingly ordered links with the political and regular regulatory apparatus of a central bureaucratic state. Paying close attention to these parochial sightings of the state allows us to see how members of the Basij are ambiguously located between local notions of sociality and an impartial bureau bureaucracy. In other words, how they appear how they appear um, as low level officials who acknowledge formal rules but are obliged to recognize the importance of personal relationships. This presents us a chance to go beyond viewing the besiege of neighborhoods as a vigilant group as an ideological space for reproduction of revolutionary rhetoric and practices in the interests of the regime. Rather, it offers us a chance to focus on, the, on lines of disputes, conflicts embedded in everyday life, and the intimate relations of neighbors. Although I do not wish to downplay the dominating power of the Basij, I emphasize the need to examine underground under, understandings of techniques of government and social relations and the flexibility of the boundaries between them. Thanks for Thank you, Ahmed. This was interesting. I was like, you know, and I already see some parallels with other research, but you know, I will leave this to the commentary. And uh, the church presenter today we have is uh, Dr. Sebastian Ramirez, and who he's a postdoctoral uh, researcher at Princeton and is working on uh, internally displaced persons in Colombia and, and as well as their changing relations to the ideas of home and citizenship in the aftermath of uh, societal violence. And then he is to present uh, his uh, research on social cleanses in Colombia, which I'm particularly interested and in, struck by, but I would say is super, uh, I don't know, uh, appealing or intriguing as well. And uh, it's his to trace uh, the pamphletos, uh, leaflets that are hung across public spaces 
and targets the underclass, I would say, maybe as like a bracket term, but you, you might object, of course, in a way that is, you know, construed um, as the only and necessary way maybe to maintain order. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much for having me. I, I do have a little PowerPoint, but it's mostly images, I promise. And I will also be uh, reading. Uh, so uh, let me just get started. The pamphlet that identified Camila as a target of the social cleanse was posted in the door of her house. The leaflet was issued by a group calling itself the Black Eagles and announced death, cleanse, and a time to scram. It continued. Curfew owed to multiple complaints from the community. We declare military objectives each person we find outside after at 10 p.m. Death to retailers of drugs, retailers of weapons, retailers of munitions, activists and gays, thieves, niches, rapists, pickpockets, junkies, and other fucking sons of bitches who, we th who think the city is theirs. Some with proper names. A list of 32 names follows. Andres Camilo, Tyron Daniel, Andres La Peluquera, Paulo, alias Camila Travesti, Nicolás Lacidosa, Camilo Lacidosa. Images intermingled with the words, a cross, a pair of rifles, and a skull and crossbones, reminders of how authority and violence were bound in the ephemera of the law of the land. Every year, thousands are selectively killed and displaced in social cleansing campaigns around Colombia, announced in pamphlets like these. Also known as the Black Hand, the selective killings have become the hallmark of the country's poorest neighborhoods, continuing unabated even after the nominal end of the conflict. Often perpetrated by neighbors under the auspices of paramilitary groups and with the complicity or even participation of the local police, these murders are touted as the necessary procedures of order in places where official justice cannot reach. Drug, drug users, petty criminals, LGBTQ folk, and especially trans women are the preeminent targets of such campaigns. When I, saw, when I saw that list, I grabbed my mom, three little things, and I got the hell out. Camila recalls sipping herbal tea in a well-lit cafe in downtown Suacha, a city just south of Bogota, the country's capital. Those pamphlets, you see them all around, she recalled. I almost knew that one day they were going to name me. I'm not able to go to sleep. I go out with fear every day. I leave work, go out, and I look at every corner trying to disguise myself. This presentation explores paralegal purges from the perspective of one of its main implements, the pamphlet, a broadside that, aping legal language, announces the targets of the social cleanse. These quasi-public documents provide a vantage from which to query the amalgamation of official and extra-official structures erected at the diffuse limits of urban growth, state capacity, on market opportunity. In examining how pamphlets publicly configure men and women as irredeemable and their lives forfeit, this paper explores what falls beyond the purview of post-war reconciliation and how the boundaries of a potential sociability are demarcated by the erasure of populations labeled problematic. Camila received a threat in a house that she and her mother built over the course of 15 years on squatted land up in Swatches Hills. Neighborhoods like theirs often grow in a relationship of intentional and carefully managed remoteness from the centers of the city's economic and political power. Poorly serviced public infrastructure, uh, poor, sorry, poorly serviced by public infrastructure, residents often trudged along unpaved roads, struggling to access electricity, sewage, and water services through networks of their own making. In this apparent absence of the state, other groups also rise to leverage claims of sovereignty and jurisdiction of local economies through illegal taxation and control over a thriving drug trade. The violence that expelled Camila and her mother from their home is central to this alternative sovereignty and is closely tied to the many endings of the country's wars. Many of those who belong to the urban militias once fought in the country's jungles, mostly under the banner of paramilitary groups that work as the state's terrorist handmaiden in its war in its war against guerrillas. Much like the connections Penn Benglas describes in Rio's favelas, drug traffickers and state agents co-participate in constructing political authority through the use of disorder, secrecy, and ambiguity. 
and in the case of Colombia, death. Pamphlets announcing the targets of the social cleanse are central to this practice. Printed at an almost industrial scale, the leaflets are posted in the cover of darkness and circulated in public spaces demarcating not just targets of the cleanse, but the reach and breadth of the authority that issues them. Like the official edicts that they ape, these, these pamphlets claim to represent a political community from which the authority to declare targets of execution springs forth. The apparent response to complaints from the community in the pamphlet issued by the Black Eagles defines an ethical comment on which the legitimacy of their rule hinges. The language they employ simultaneously parrots the cumbersome paper language of officialdom alongside colloquial idioms and obscenities. Curfews and military targets are invoked alongside fucking sons of bitches, calling references of legal and illegal forms of subjection in a heteroglossia of violent rule. Pamphlets occupy these neighborhoods outlining the jurisdiction claimed by violent actors. The streets and hills that they command, as well as the relationships that figure under their regulating gaze. Yep. Their vision of order is structured around the ordering of the particular brand of governance, commerce, and the configuration of particular ethical modes of life. Any actors that may compete economically and militarily are named at the outset death to retailers of drugs, of weapons, of munitions, if you recall. These are followed by those who threaten the purported governance of the Black Eagles, either by appealing to state sources of authority, the snitches, or by inviting different organization of political power, the activists. Crimes against the general population, thieves, pickpockets, rapists, um, are coupled with uh, drug users and gays as enemies of the populace, irredeemably outside the bounds of conviviality. Although gays are only mentioned in passing in the categorical list of infractions, control over gender normativity is central to the pamphlets as a whole. Most of the names in the lists are followed by descriptions that simultaneously identify their gender identities as it seeks, seeks to fix them within a biologized uh, sexual normativity. Andres la peluquera, the female hairdresser, Camila is named as Pablo first and Travesti a crossdresser. Uh, Nicolas and Camilo are identified by their HIV zero positive status in the feminine, La Cidosa. Queerness, drug consumption, and violent criminality are conflated as a sort of wanton disregard for the bonds of community that threaten not just to harm the quote unquote decent folk, but to debase them and turn them into lesser humans. The insistence on biology as both that which is denied and that which now threatens the general population is meant to alert the reader of the pamphlet of the potential of, for impurity to mar the community at large. The announcement of the sentence also fixes into focus the apparent visibility endured by those living under the Black Eagle's gaze. Intimate knowledge is identified as a site of governance and announced to those not named that they too live under the panopticon of the clamps. The, the pamphlet proliferates among businesses and houses, entering quotidian spaces that are then made pure through the sacrifice of the marked by the black hand. Those spared enjoy the security of being the community, at least for now. When I asked her how she knew that it was a real threat, Camila offered a cocked smile, a sly smile, and said, I mi niño, in a tone so sweet it dripped with condescension. We know that these things are never a joke. We know because we live it. Indeed, for years, Camila had worked as an advocate for LGBTQ youth in Suacha and knew firsthand the threats that they faced. She had experienced the violence of individuals and groups throughout her life and now leveraged those experiences to guide others to their most intense crises. If I told you, Sebastian, all the things that have happened to me, we would just sit here all day and cry. She would often say to me, but now, I don't let anything get to me. She brought the pamphlet that bore her name to the police and the mayor's office. But after an investigation, her concerns were dismissed. I approached a friend who worked in the local administration and asked about the ordeal. We did an investigation, he reported, towing the official line, and determined that it was not a real pamphlet. The way the investigation went, I was informed, a group of policemen and bureaucrats got together in a room and looked at the paper. It didn't have enough spelling errors. The formatting was too clear. The real logo of the Black Eagles was missing, I was informed. So we concluded it was fake. 
When I asked who then had issued the threat, I was told the police agreed that it was a problem within the community. Camila was more succinct. They, they claim it's a problem among the faggots. We are very dramatic. The, the pamphlet closes with another threat and a promise. Good boys go to sleep early. We'll lay, we'll lay down the disobedient ones. Residents of Suacha, don't worry, we are here and we'll stay to always offer you support, security and control over the area. So you will live in peace from the thugs we mentioned. This concern over the language of security connects this murderer's gangs to the paramilitary forebears and their inextric inextricable links to state actors. The Black Eagles are a criminal band of national reach, widely considered a remnant of the Autodefensas Unidas de Colombia, a paramilitary group officially disbanded in 2004. In the 1960s, large landowners created private militias to help the Colombian army in order to protect themselves from guerrillas' extortions. The groups quickly grew into independent armies that fought fiercely against the guerrillas, often in collaboration with official forces. These paramilitary groups espoused far-right policies and inflicted violent punishment on civilian populations they considered enemy collaborators. Leftist political actors, those who refused to pay their extortion fees, or simply those whose lands they could steal, were targeted with threats, displacement, and assassination. Security discourses were central to the legitimating efforts of these groups in ways that closely followed those proffered by the state. These so-called so self-defense groups presented their campaigns as attempts to, quote, reassume state presence through the appropriation and extension of violence. The state often recognized this role, tolerated or even collaborated with paramilitary groups. Carlos Castaño, who was architect of the paramilitary strategy of until his assassination in 2004, said in an interview, the territories that we control are not our under, under our control. In reality, the state controls them. Whereas the state identifies guerrillas as the single most important purveyor of insecurity, paramilitary groups expand the securitized gaze up to other sites of surveillance and control. In her study of counterinsurgent power in Colombia, Vilma Franco notes social demands for security are configured around the existence of thieves, sex workers, drug addicts, rapists, etc. With mercenaries, which mercenaries are eager to fulfill and then allow them to apply the principle of protego ergo vigo, around which they consolidate their domination. By claiming to protect a social order from imagined threats to its moral constitution, paramilitary groups lay partial claim to the legitimating power of the state and demand obedience and ransom from their words. Pamphlets are central to these strategies as they provide a, as a quasi-legal medium that claiming protection invests these groups with the authority to define the boundaries of biopolitical belonging. The pamphlets allude to law both by imitating, even at a remove its voice, its claims to authority and the materiality of its circulation. The fixity of the written word and the finality of its ver verdicts obscure the continuous potential for naming new and unexpected subjects of the cleanse. When I asked Camila how she protected herself and her friends from the violence they encountered so often, and which so often is so often dismissed by those charged with their protection, she invited me to her home. She led me to a locked room in the back where she revealed a small altar with candles and a few pictures of saints, a Virgin Mary, and a skull. She lit a cigarette, placed it on the table, and gently touched the grinning head. We're put in the same pool as street dwellers, and here in Colombia it is alarming that these murders are happening with leaders of the LG LGBTQ community. But the cleansing rituals, but with cleansing rituals, self-protection and our saint Santa Marta and the Archangel uh, Michael, we protect ourselves. The faint smell of dried herbs, rosemary, mejorana, ruda, filled the room. We use what Mother Earth gave us and protect ourselves from what is happening whether it is social cleansing or the assassination of social leaders. It is a connection with the earth to isolate us from dangers. Here, a different cleanse it was mobilized. The plants protect, the bats are a protection and a shield from the bad things that they can do to me. Sicarius also entrust themselves to the Virgin and we entrust ourselves to the herbs. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian, this was striking again. And I don't know, I think the panel has like a quite good coherence and I don't know, maybe escalation. We started with like, you know, Jamaican experience, um, which is like almost a benign uh, amalgamation of like legal system. 
and then moved on to negotiations in Iran and then moved on to like a bit more, I would say, gloomy picture in Colombia. So it was like a really coherent line actually in my case. But yeah, I'm sure people have questions, but you know, we will move on to first um, uh, Denis's commentary. And uh, after this, we'll take some questions, uh, but I will get back to the presenters first to respond to the discuss discussion. And then after, I will take questions. And uh, maybe I, will, I shall introduce, ah, uh, pardon, uh, Davide, can you make Denis a co-host, please? I think she can't turn on her camera. And then in the meantime, I can introduce Denise again. Uh, she's uh, she's uh, the major figure, I would say, a force behind this like very gathering. And then she's currently working as the uh, postdoctoral fellow at the Technical University in Berlin, but is soon to take up her position as a lecturer at Newcastle University in the UK. And good news as well for us, I guess. <laughs> And then she has conducted in, in like the extensive research in uh, Istanbul and explored the interplay between policing, uh, leftist resistance, and counterinsurgency technologies um, employed by state security apparatuses. And then, in addition to her multiple other um, publications, she her monograph is coming out uh, from Cornell University Press next year, early next year, I guess. And then the title is Police provocation and politics. And then uh, through this monograph, she's going to explore or demonstrate uh, policing vigilantism and their counter uh, intuitive reverberations and entanglements. And then the, the floor is yours, Dennis. Thank you very much. You can hear me, right? Thank you very much. That's, that was an amazing panel. Uh, and uh, I, I have, um, a lot of comments and uh, it was really, really to all, uh, all talks are very uh, thought provoking and in a way very different from one another, but also very, very related to one another. So I just like underline the similarities. First of all, I think that these three papers showed us very brilliantly the importance of intimacies and the, and the neighborhoods, local scales in controlling communities. Uh, so, as opposed to the distant and cold and bureaucratic presence of the state, local security agents are, legal or extra-legal security agents, are actually among the main actors in providing security and also providing insecurity uh, in, the local in the local scale, especially among the marginalized and racialized communities, especially in Rilke's paper and in uh, Sebastian's uh, paper as well. So um, I really, starting with uh, Rilke's paper, I really liked the notion of legal hybridity. And I also really liked um, that you are kind of decentering the relation, decentering the state law and showing us the interconnections between, first of all, law and violence, I would say, perhaps from a Benjaminian perspective. And also, uh, and also the multiple entanglements between uh, multiple legal and quote unquote extra legal actors. So you can, you are actually broaden the sphere of the legality to show us how legal order uh, actually incorporates multiple form of legality, control, mechanisms and modalities of violence, uh, violence. So, and I really liked that um, you mentioned um, how extrajudicial uh, violence actually also op operates as a kind of a state vigilantism, because when you said uh, extra legal violence, the first thing came to my mind, oh, why aren't we talking about state vigilantism? So state actors, state security actors are also function as uh, vigilante, um, as vigilantes as well, and that really, ties very closely to Ahmed Moradi's uh, paper, actually, where we see that uh, state security actors have their own official vigilante groups who are functioning at the, I mean, uh, according to the official uh, conventional definitions of vigilantism, we wouldn't call them as vigilantes, but, but in the context of Ahmed Moradi's, actually, they also function as vigilante groups. What I really found interesting also 
in Rivke's uh, paper is that that the demand for justice and equality, because the because in both in Sebastian's and Rivke's case, we see an um, state which which neither monopolized its uh, monopolized its violence nor its monop nor its legitimacy. So state in both cases are kind of, is kind of an not totally a legitimate actor of providing order. Uh, and you show us very Rivke very brilliantly how uh, vigilante forces. Have a kind have kind of a legitimacy due to the structural due to the structural um, violence imposed on the on the most racialized and marginalized poor communities. So in this case, the vigilante actors, local neighbor local neighborhood uh, vigilantes, are considered to be more legitimate than the state. But also the mimetic relationship between the two, because we always Talk we uh, up until recently the literature uh, recently uh, sorry the literature emphasized the uh, um, emphasized how vigilantes mimics the state but you are showing us how the, the state is mimicking the vigilantes and that actually that's at the theoretical level shows us the um, the deep connection between state and non-state actors in providing uh, law and order and security. So I think that's a great example to go deeper on these uh, deeply rooted entanglements and the artificiality of the state, actually, if you are making sense here. And in Sebastian's case, and that's extremely, extremely uh, obvious in the darkest sense of the term. But what I really found also interesting in, um, I'm still continuing on Rivke's case uh, paper, what I really found interesting is the seemingly contradictory position of, uh, of the residents. Uh, and that is, on the one hand, demanding justice for equality, but on the other hand, demanding an authoritarian form of control. So that loss of, uh, loss of hope, I, uh, if I may say, on, on kind of a democratic central or local governance and asking for more authoritarian kind of a control. So, so here is my question, and that's really very much related to the larger questions I, I have in my, may, in my hands uh, for a long time, that how can we understand disorder um, and crime as an, as an actually force that legitimizes and makes the marginalized communities demand more right-wing and authoritarian forms of government? So do you see a link between the two, that's my main question to you. And uh, to uh, Ahmad, um, as I said, uh, your paper too shows very brilliantly how we can, we have to go beyond, uh, we, we have to look at the local scale to understand the operations of security and the importance of intimacy controlling people. But in your case, you also uh, show us that how um, from where we sit in, in the Western part of the world, in a country which is seemed absolutely authoritarian and controlling the populations, 100% oppressive and 100% authoritarian, you, are, you show us the, us, the, um, us the spaces of negotiation and shows us, show us that actually at the local level, there is some sphere for, for de facto democracy. I may say, I mean, if, I don't know if you would put it in that way. So, the, so you say that you show us the impossibility in a way of, a, of the total control when it comes to the question of legitimacy. And I also read your paper uh, and then you there also mentioned the question of justice. When it seems unjust, uh, then the state, then you have to negotiate, but the state doesn't negotiate, but it negotiates through its local agents so i so my question in 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 here is that we know that um vigilantism or sometimes and most often than not operates in collusion with the state uh, but when it, it uh, when um, when it is seemed more legitimate than the state forces the state security apparatus then becomes more harsh on vigilantes but in this case we what we see is more like a uh, these local vigilante groups are kind of a 
um, negotiated in between groups, between the state and uh, and the society. So I would uh, love to hear uh, more about that. But also I have another question. Again, you didn't mention the question of justice in here, but I read your paper. And in your paper, um, you say when, when, when it's the question of justice, then there's more space for negotiation at the local level. And I'm here asking, what is considered just? So, so uh, what kind of a justice, I mean, uh, has legitimacy or what is considered as justice? Let me put it in, that, in these communities. So again, and here I am moving forward to Sebastian's uh, presentation. Uh, are there spaces of non-complicity or refusal of complicity? And are there spaces of ultimate conflict which will not, which will never be resolved? Does it make sense? I don't know. Do you hear me? Okay, <laughs> perfect. So I am here uh, moving to Sebastian's question, Sebastian's uh, presentation, which of course, due to the history of the war and the long uh, going conflict and long enduring colonial legacies on, on top of everything, which uh, poses, uh, which presents a darker uh, picture of, uh, of that. But again, can you brilliantly show the blurred boundaries and the legal and illegal? And I really like the phrase, the, the pamphlet, how the pamphlet uh, works as a quick, well, quasi legal medium. So that was just, uh, just uh, what uh, I, so in your space for negotiation or like local scale democratic practices in contrast to what uh, Ahmad Moradi portrayed. So what I am, but I really, uh, I would love to hear more about the final part actually, that asking uh, for, looking for a kind of a conflict re re resolution, not in this world, but beyond this world, but not only beyond this world, but also in the nature, in the herbs, in the mother earth. So how can we go beyond um, in understanding um, the, the in, 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 uh, how can we develop an approach that's not restrained with this secular and uh, religious division? How can we look at looking for, for a resolution or peace in Mother Mary and all these religious symbols without merely considering them as, uh, as religious symbols. Is there a possibility for that? So uh, here I stop. Uh, thank you very much again for brilliant uh, presentations. And yeah. Thank you very much, Denise. I am sure it was also like a forceful engagement, I would say, with all, every one of the papers. And I. I'm looking forward to your uh, commentaries and responses. Maybe we'll, yeah, maybe we can start again with like the same like the order, Rizke, first you, and then Ahmed, and then Sebastian. Thank you so much for your for your, also because I sent you my paper at the very 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 last minute. <laughs> um, but I, I think you really you summarized it beautifully and and uh, uh, really uh, drew out uh, I think better than I did myself some of the analytical. Um, Points I want to make, and and I, I do agree also that what what connects the papers is uh, yeah the, the sort of mix of the intimacy and and the spatiality of intimacy. So how, how that works, you know, uh, coming into your front door, beyond your front door, uh, as well as at the space of the neighborhood. Um, I thought also it's not a direct answer to your question, but uh, the way that sexuality works in, in multiple ways. I think uh, I, I'm not so sure about Iran, but but uh, definitely in Jamaica, there's a lot of resonances. Not necessarily parallels, but the way that that sexuality uh, can, can work to legitimize, but also to delegitimize um, vigilantism. Um, but but your main question was really about uh, something I'm trying to figure out myself. But um, how could how could we understand this tension? Uh, I don't know if it's a contradiction, though. It definitely seems to be one between um, sort of a desire for equality and justice and democracy, which I think is very strong. And a desire for strong men and sort of authoritarian sort of law and order. Uh, and I'm trying to, so I've been working on the dance for quite some time, but now I'm trying to 
connect all the sort of mini articles into also a larger book. And, and it's precisely this I want to get at. How, how can we see, how can we think with the figure of the Don uh, to understand also uh, another type of strong man who, who is uh, located in the state? So, so how can we think of authority, political authority uh, as currently, I think, uh, but maybe always, but certainly now uh, being performed precisely by, by this dance between sort of uh, being uh, embedded in, in um, state institutions and democratic institutions, as well as outside of them and, and sort of this use of violence and a personalist, strong man, authoritarian. So I think, you know, Trump, but also of course Erdogan, um, you, you name, you know, there's, there's so many figures we could name across the world. And I think the Dons uh, might seem to be the sort of the mirror image of this, but it's, it's the same. I think the question is also less in the, these men themselves and in why uh, or why we want that. So I, I think it's not all, it doesn't need to be right-wing politics, so, so often it is. But um, so I tried to figure this, this question out uh, right now and I don't have a clear answer, but I think we could also see it slightly more hopefully than, than your question uh, suggests. So you, you asked uh, how to understand, let's say, crime and disorder as a force that makes populations demand right wings or authoritarian responses, if, if I understood correctly. But we could also ask how might we see even in the most authoritarian context, um, so perhaps it's something that Ahmed could, could uh, respond to, but maybe also in Colombia or other cases. How is there still also a need for, for the most powerful strongmen to uh, perform, if only at sort of like a aesthetic level, but often more, more I think, uh, thoroughly, to, to also perform this allegiance to democratic institutions uh, and to seek legitimacy. So I think everywhere you look, even if you see the most violent, coercive, um, leaders, you will also see a constant sort of, uh, not just a, a looking for legitimacy through violence or, or provision of, of public goods, but also really through uh, these gestures towards democracy, equality, justice. Uh, so that doesn't solve it, but, but I think it's a slightly more hopeful way of seeing it than only saying like uh, democracy is eroding uh, and we're moving towards authoritarianism. Because you could also say, even within authoritarian systems, you see this uh, this need to to uh, yeah, at least uh, gesture towards democratic ideals and, and to perform the aesthetics, if not sort of uh, the reality of democracy. Thank you, Rifke. Uh, by the way, I, can, I should remind the audience that they can type their names and then we can just give them the uh, microphone afterwards. And then I'm turning, giving the microphone now to Ahmed. And uh, and then I mean, can I also add one thing? In, in, I'm sure you want to respond. Can you also clarify like the institutional organizational limits of Basij? Because you know, I think they I just checked quickly, and then they seem to be also have organic links to Revolutionary Guard. How independent? How non-state are they? I'm also curious. They're just like oh, not only, but like, I'm sure it's also connected to Denise's question. So. Yes, and thank you very much, Denise and and, and uh, Errol for for the comments. Um, and then, and, and as uh, the, so, Dennis summarized the papers very well and, and found the connections. Uh, so regarding the questions, uh, uh, so the passage has a very um, peculiar positioning towards the state. It is funded by the state, but it started as a pop revolutionary popular force. And, and it still uh, uh, remained in that position. So in my research, I have focused on exactly that, like how uh, the besiege moves in and out of the state. And, and, and the question is like how a, an, an organization which is funded by the state tries to remain revolutionary and to persuade people to, to remain and act uh, in a revolutionary way, which is a, a grave paradox. But this, this paradox is inherent in all the uh, revolutionary states. So how to, when uh, so successful uh, uh, revolutionary movements always face this dilemma when they are in power, how to keep the revolution alive. So this task 
is for the uh, for the Basij uh, to do. And uh, so, th so this is my whole PhD project. And, and in connection to the question of authoritarianism and, and, and how uh, um, and, and the appeal to democratic uh, means, I have to say that this is why my part of my uh, project is to answer uh, the, the intersection between militancy and care and how so Basij as a paramilitary force goes to poor neighborhoods uh, in order to provide care and social assistance. And, 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 and the thing is like how through uh, the appeal to participation, social assistance and democratic uh, um, uh, words and terms, they uh, reinforce authoritarian structures. So that's like the whole, uh, the whole idea behind the project. And by provisioning care, they create inequalities, reinforce inequalities, and, and maintain the exclusionary measures. Uh, so basically to go back to uh, Denise's question about the role of the Basij, yes, they are, they act as intermediary forces. So they are, bit, so they are state funded. They, they say that they are part of this civil society. They are, uh, um, uh, they are acting as a popular force. So they want to be all at the same time, and, and they are the product of a grave paradox of having and governing a uh, revolutionary state in a country. So, um, um, so that's that's how it is, and, and that's like uh, so. This they, I guess, they are the best example to blur the boundaries between the state and non-state actors, between uh, provision of security and insecurity, between warfare and welfare, and all the rest of. Uh, the second question was about revolution justice, uh, about justice. So I have to say that uh, the, the meaning of justice is revolutionary justice, and it was established right from the beginning, uh, and it has an, a Marxist undertone. Because Islamists, when they took over the uh, the, uh, the revolution in 1979, uh, they had an Islamic reading of how to manage the society, but, the, but they didn't really have a, a powerful ideology. This is a misreading of Iranian revolution, of course, that is claimed to be Islamic. It was more of like, it, it was inspired by Marxist ideas, in Latin America and in, in the Middle East and all the rest of it. So their idea was uh, about the, in the poor neighborhoods, when uh, the poor are claiming and demanding justice, they mean revolutionary justice, which means erosion of class differences and prioritization of uh, the needs of the poor. Uh, in, so paradoxically, Basij wants to do the same, wants and pushes the state and accuses the politicians that they have failed to provide uh, uh, and, and, and fulfill the needs of the poor while they are there in poor neighborhoods to persuade the poor that this, the revolution is relevant to their life and the regime is very good. So again, this is part of this, uh, their contradiction. And this is again inherent in uh, their ideology and in their practices. And of course, this, there is no way to solve it. That's, that's, it is there. Um, yeah, I guess I, 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 I responded to all the questions. So I, I can continue in Q&A. Thanks. Thanks. This was also quite illuminating, I have to say. And then Sebastian. Uh, so thank you for the, the wonderful comments and, and questions. Uh, I think uh, to speak to this issue of, of how these you know, other rituals kind of create new spaces of, of action is also a question of, of that was kind of at the center of, of my presentation and my concern here is a question of, of aesthetics. So very much what, what Rivka was mentioning a second ago, that uh, the need to, to perform a certain allegiance to uh, a, a democratic order is central to like how legitimacy is constructed in these spaces. And, uh, and in, in here, by looking at the, at the leaflets, we, we really see how this is a performance that is very much concerned with the aesthetics of it, with its presentation, right? Like it has to look the right way, right? So like, it's not just that it's a, that something that looks like uh, an official edict, but it also has to like make the right claims and the people performing it have to do the right things, right? So they, in Colombia, uh, 
it, it, it means a connection to this history of uh, violent confrontation, right? So uh, the, the neo-paramilitaries have to look sort of like an army. They have to like organize themselves sort of like uh, this particular uh, mode of governance that has ex like existed in Colombia for a long time. Um, and, uh, and I think something that is remarkable is, you know, like in, in many uh, post-colonial settings, um, this breakdown of, of the symbolism and the, and the, and the imagery of, of the state means that all these objects are kind of up for, for grabs, right? Some people can make lay claim to many of the images and symbols of the state to kind of rehash their own claims to legitimacy and their own claims to authority. And, and in sort of in that sense, this project became a concern of how aesthetics becomes like this space of struggle, the space to kind of refigure uh, the possibility of authority, but also the possibility of action, like outside of, of certain forms of authority, right? And and that's where like this other spiritual cleanses open a, a new space for me uh, to think about like you know uh, mobilization and action, right? Because I, I there is a way in which um, paramilitary uh, organizations are are organizing uh, through these images a vision of the less than human right they, ha they have to organize all these people as less than human so they can be eliminated and killed and that is again an aesthetic form of action so these folks then turn to something that is more than human to reclaim their humanity right so the earth is a larger than human presence right the the spiritual is larger than human the you know it, it connects you to a different subjectivity that exists outside of you and then you can start making claims of yourself as like goddess, uh, a claim uh, to yourself as, as the inheritor of, of the earth, and therefore uh, reclaims your presence in, in a social uh, environment. Um, and, and that's why you also see that those photographs that I was using, because in, in doing all of this, I, re I recognize that uh, the intervention of the, the, the theoretical intervention has to also engage with, with aesthetics. Um, it has to also take into consideration how this production kind of like constantly needs to be aware of how it presents itself. Uh, so uh, the, the project, uh, my project is now created in association with a photographer and with these women who have been the targets of these, um, uh, of these uh, death threats uh, to create kind of an artistic project that encapsulates their vision of, of mobilization and, and activity uh, through different means. So like, they, like the, the, the art project kind of tries to give an imagistic presentation of this more than human world that they have created in the face of, of, of their denial of their humanity. Um, and it's something that they do kind of constantly through uh, other means as well, but like the photographs allow you to, to get to there. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. We were too clear and there are no questions. Uh, okay, <laughs> I think they were quite forceful as like accounts as well in a sense as a, like an audience. I haven't read the papers myself, but uh, they gave a really clear depiction almost like you know what they are doing in a sense and then how they are doing it as well. Uh, any question from the audience at all? Or